so I wanted to talk today about Procona Replication Manager, um, and the slides are downloadable from that URL, um, and they're up there now if you really want to get them right now. I'm Shiri Cabral, I work for Mozilla, um, and I run these, uh, these user group meetings. Um, so what is the Procona Replication Manager? You may also see it as PRM. It's mainly for high availability. And you can do things like automatic failover, you can promote a slave to be a master, you can do read-write splitting with virtual IPs. What it actually is underneath is a set of tools. It's not one particular thing, it's a bunch of different ones. It was created by Baron Schwartz and, and um, Ives Trudeau at the end of 2011. So it's been around for a couple of years. It's been around for just a little over two years. And I assume that Procona uses it and, and you know, has you know, a fine time doing it. They haven't deprecated anything, but it's interesting because you'll see they haven't, like the documentation was last written to um, July of 2012. So it's either not being updated and need, needs to be updated or it doesn't need to be updated because it's just, it is what it is, like it just works. Both of those are interesting scenarios to think about because if it just works and there's nothing new needed, that's pretty cool. And if there's stuff that needs to be updated and it isn't, that's not cool. Um, it uses standard tools. And I say quote unquote standard because not every, you know, the, the, even though we've been doing things like high availability for probably about two decades, there's problems with all the, there's pros and cons to all the technologies being used. All the tools that they use are open source. Um, it uses your existing MySQL, so you don't have to change that. And if you're using MariaDB or Procona server, whatever. MySQL. It uses Pacemaker to decide, you know, what happens where, which is the cluster management tool. So that's that's what really kind of does all the heavy lifting. Um, and it uses CoroSync for the messages that passes back and forth. So that's the communication system. You can also use Heartbeat if you prefer Heartbeat. You might be familiar with the, you know, combining Pacemaker and Heartbeat together. That's something that people have been doing for probably a decade and a half or so. You can if you want. They use CoroSync. I'm guessing that CoroSync is the new heartbeat, <laughs> that somebody somebody wrote Coro Sync to be better than heartbeat because it's basically Coro and Sync and heart and beat, it's the same kind of thing. But Coro Sync comes from a different, it actually was derived from AIS, so. And then the last part of it is a MySQL resource agent. And this actually works with Pacemaker. So Pacemaker, when you download Pacemaker, there's actually a directory of resource agents. And that basically tells Pacemaker what to do with the programs because each program has something different. So what does it mean when a, serv a service is down on a server? Like that is a specialized thing for each one, right? HTTP, you know, your Apache server being down is different from your MySQL server being down. Um, and the MySQL resource agent is the only original component here, right? Pacemaker, CoroSync, that's, that's not anything that's written by Procona. The resource agent is though. So why these tools? Why not make their own system? Well, they're already standard, they're already being used, and they already have a good track record. And also, never underestimate the power of somebody else developing it, right? If somebody else is developing it, you're not developing it, you can have, you can free up your own resources to do other things, right? So Procona only had to develop the agent itself. They didn't have to develop the rest of the framework, uh, which is a huge deal. And the rest of the framework has been around for a while. Um, like I said, Pacemaker's been around at least since at least since the early 2000s, if not earlier. I mean, that's, that's my knowledge of it. So it's been around for a long time. And if it's a mature technology, why not use it? OpenStack, for example, uses the combination of Pacemaker and CoroSync. Um, and OpenStack is the, the open source cloud solution. If it's good enough for OpenStack, probably good enough for us. Now, using many tools means that there's, there's a lot to learn, right? Because you have to learn everything about CoroSync and everything about Pacemaker. And, the, and well, you probably know a lot of stuff about MySQL already, so that's not a big deal. But that's one of the cons is that you have all these different tools and, and you need to learn a lot about them. But there is a lot of information out there. So you're not relying on one company to document everything, right? It's people are gonna use CoroSync and there's going to be a community around that. People are gonna use Pacemaker and there's a community around that. Getting the tools, CoroSync um, is on github.io. Um, Pacemaker is clusterlabs.org. And then Procona's Pacemaker MySQL agent is on GitHub as well. Um, and it's also in the recent versions of the resource agents that you can get with Pacemaker. And there's no releases. You just, you can either check out from GitHub or you can wget from GitHub. Or like I said, there's in resource agents, there's a version and I have it written down later in a slide of which version of resource agents you can get. 
So, and I, I'm assuming you already have MySQL. So for Pacemaker, there are a lot of configuration options. We're not gonna go through all of them. We're just gonna go through the ones you need to set it up. So this talk is only gonna cover some of it. But Pacemaker really is the heavy lifter of this Percona Application Manager solution. Um, it maintains a cluster information base. So you'll see a lot of things abbreviated CIB for cluster information base. And all that means is information about the cluster, right? That's where all the information is. Um, so yeah, CIB is the cluster information base. The, the way that this information is shared, right? So you configure something, but how does it talk to everything else is through CoroSync. So CoroSync coordinates the communication among all the nodes. Um, it uses an event queue and it uses totem over UDP. That's the protocol it uses. That's just like saying MySQL uses, you know, um, the MySQL protocol over TCP. You know, I haven't gone and researched totem or whatever. That's just what it uses. And this is, CoroSync is the default for communication in Percona Replication Manager. But like I said before, if you want to use Heartbeat, you can, and there, I'm sure there's others. Again, this is an open technology, open source tools. So if you wrote your own communication um, manager, you could probably use that too if you really wanted to. So the MySQL resource agent is a bash script. And it supports things like stopping, starting, monitoring, promoting. So there's a lot you can do with this bash script. And that's really kind of the meat, and that is, of course, what Percona wrote to make it so that you can use per Pacemaker and CoroSync to manage your cluster and have auto failover and things like that. And this is the only original part of Percona Replication Manager. So that, that's what's new. So let's talk about setting it up. Um, there's a lot of parts to it, and it's not hard, but it is pretty detailed. And there is a guide on how to do that in the GitHub that Percona has and it, you kind of follow it step by step. There's some pieces that are kind of like, why are you telling me this now? You should tell me later. So that's kind of the impetus for me doing this presentation was, it's not always easy to figure out what's going on or why they did it. Like when I was first setting it up, I looked at them like, why are they doing this? Or they say, oh, you'll need this later. It's like, well, when do I really need it later? And it's something like, oh, you'll need the socket later. I'm like, okay, well, let me remember the socket. And then it's just, you need the socket to configure um, pacemaker, like not a big deal. Do you need to be able to tell Pacemaker to talk to MySQL? So therefore, you need the socket. So this is the URL for where it is. You know, if you look up Percona Replication Manager, like, you'll get to this page. Obviously, when you download the uh, the slides, you'll have this, so you can just click on that. Again, it wasn't up. To, it hasn't been updated since June of 2012, um, so that's probably a good thing. So the first thing you want to do is install your core packages, Coros and Pacemaker. Um, and just use whatever your favorite package manager is. Maybe it's uh, apt-get, maybe it's uh, yum install. So you just do yum install pacemaker corosync, apt-get, install pacemaker corosync. First install the packages. And I'm assuming you already have MySQL installed. I mean, these are all local to the node itself. So corosync, so the other thing I should probably tell, say, is I, I didn't draw any graphs, but there's no like centralized administrative server. All the nodes talk to each other. So there's no single point of failure there. So CoreSync messaging, when you're messaging back and forth, you need to know who you're talking to, and it kind of requires authentication. Um, there's actually two ways you can do the messaging. You can do it by broadcast, or you can do it by multicast. And either way, you kind of need to make sure that the message is getting to who you want it to get to. So you do need some authentication. You do this via keys, um, and use the CoreSync keygen program. So after you've downloaded CoreSync, the first thing you want to do is generate some keys. They say, like, make sure there's entropy on the machine, so run like a big tar while you're doing it, or make sure it's a machine that's like running things. You know, again, if you have like a private VLAN and all that kind of stuff, which you're probably doing anyway because if you're using MySQL and you don't want your data transmitted in the clear, and maybe you're doing it over SSL, and that's great, so you, so you might want to think about the entropy, but. I, I ran into that one time on a, I have a micro EC2. I was like, why is this command taking forever? And then. I looked it up, and there's, there's actually like an entropy generator that was shoved stuff in there when you ran or whatever it is. Uh -huh. And that actually kickstarted it and made any key. Like, so like, basically, if you're on like a cloud machine that has, like, a lot of the EC2 instances have like no entropy. It's trying to get some, so you'll be waiting for a while, so. Yeah. Do standard systems have this issue, or, or no. just the cloud? It's only come about. Yeah, it's, it be, yeah. Yeah, I've never... it's mostly cloud, because it's a shared system, so like it's using trying to be authentic and random instead of generating, but... Right. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, you'd think it'd be the way around. You'd think right. if, if you need to generate entropy by doing something, you'd think a shared server would have plenty going on. Right. Um, 
So yeah, so that, so I guess it might be important if you're on a shared server. See, I just assumed that it would have stuff going on, so it wouldn't matter. So the chorusing keys are just like SSH keys. You once you get the file called off key, once it's finished, you copy it to all the nodes, and then you you know chone it. It has to be um, owned by root and have a group of root, and it has to be read only by the user. So Chmato 400, just like SSH keys. So the initial configuration of chorusing. Usually the file is etsy chorusing chorusing .conf, not a big deal. Um, and there are different sections that are in curly braces. So for example, the first section that you want to talk about is compatibility. What's your compatibility? Well, your compatibility could be none, which means it's only compatible with chorusync. And when I say chorusync version one, it's on version one right now. You can also have a compatibility of white tank, which is compatible with open AIS, which is basically where chorusync came from. That was kind of derived, it was derived from AIS. I mean, I don't think you should have a problem because I don't think you need to be compatible with previous versions if this is the first time you're ever using Chorosync. All the examples say compatibility white tank, so I don't know what the pros or cons of, of doing it versus not doing it are. So here's an example for logging, right? So that was the compatibility section. The logging section, file line off, to standard error no, to log file yes. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory. To syslog yes. Um, and you can change all of these clearly. Here's the log file you, you might want to use. Um, turn debugging off versus on would be a lot more verbose. Put a timestamp in it. Um, have, a subsyst have a subsystem. So AMF is an event thing, and there's actually an AMF section, which we won't go into. But that's just kind of like if you want it to go to an event handler, use AMF. This is all stuff that you can read about. It's a more advanced topic. Uh, I just kind of want to stick with how do you have a working file so that you can get this up and running so that you can then turn off a node and see that it works, see that failover works. So then there's a totem section. Now remember, a totem is the protocol it's using over UDP. So that's why you're configuring uh, a chorus and can you have this section named totem. So version two, secure auth on, thread zero. This interface is the most important thing. This is kind of really the, the meat of it is, is this interface sub configuration. So the ring number is zero. So the ring number starts at zero. There's a different value for each interface you're using, and it's for a redundant ring protocol. And it's basically how each interface knows how to connect with each ring when you're using redundant rings. Bind net address, this is probably the more, most important one you'll use for the chorus and configuration. And this actually just tells you what address to bind to. By default, Chorusync will use the network interface on the machine that is on that subnet, right? So if I have a machine that's 172.30.222.123, but it also has a local host, it's also on some other subnet, it's gonna use that interface. Now the caveat is, is that this is only for IPv4, because IPv6 doesn't have a way to, I don't think it has a way to specify addresses like that. So that makes it easier to configure on many machines. So if you have four machines and they're all on the same subnet, you can just copy the configuration file, because you don't need to change it. If you're on IPv6, you have to specify the full address so on four different machines, you have four different addresses. So it's a little more difficult for that configuration. So the, the interface, the ring number, is that per machine, or each, each machine within a ring can have the same zero? Each machine within a ring would have the same zero. It's the name of the ring. So you could theoretically have more than one ring on the same subnet. Okay. I don't think I would recommend that, but you could. Oh, uh, so what do you do if you don't, if they're on different networks? Well, then on each machine, right, if you have, let's say, two machines in one network and two machines in another, these two machines could have the same binet address and these two machines. I mean, you can specify the full IPv4 address, too, on each one if you want it. It's just that there's this shortcut if you don't. Some different network. Right, so the question is if you had two different VLANs, how would, yeah. you know, if you're on the same VLAN, you could use broadcast traffic. How, if you're not on the same VLAN, how do you do that? And the answer is multicast. Um, in fact, that's usually what's recommended. So you have a multicast address, and you can specify a port as well. You can actually do broadcast, and I think you just do broadcast colon true, and then you're using broadcast. Um, but broadcast is not recommended <laughs> uh, for, for complicated messages like this. It's not recommended. They said it, that multicast seems to be used more than broadcast. So, I mean, you also don't want to broadcast if you're on, like, AWS, right? <laughs> is it just like, is, it, is multicast like a multicast from, like, server or something that you register. I, I didn't pay attention at that uh -huh. when we were doing multicast. So, if a, I'll be fine. I can answer with this. Multicast means that you send one packet to the router and the router sends it to anyone to subscribe to it. Okay. So it's more efficient. 
how do you like, you always with the or Oh, I see. So you specify the route. That's the router. That's the multicast router. It's the multicast. Each. It's an address that anyone's going to subscribe to. You get those messages. That's Brooklyn. That's what? That's Brooklyn. When you use the oh, 255 for the no, that's not too to do that address right there. Right, this is like 226.94.1.1. They do say to avoid 224.x.x.x because that is a configuration multicast. So don't use that. But I mean, talk to your networking people. Yeah. There's also a time to live. Um, the time to live is a number of seconds, and it's only valid when using multicast, right? Because when you're using broadcast, you just broadcast. You can increase this up to 255. But that's only used when you're using a routed network. So if you're not using a routed network, you can leave it at one. It'll probably be fine. So you're done with configuring Corosync. Now start it by doing service Corosync start. And you can verify with uh, Corosync object control. Now what does that look like? So here is Corosync object control. There's a lot of outputs. So if you just grep for members and grep for IP, you'll see something like this. So here is the members in totem, right? Now it's starting to get a little complicated when you're looking at the output, but you can see that it has this IP address 172.30.222.212. That's in the, the bind net address of 172.30.222. blank. And then here's another one, 193. So you have these two that are now messaging each other. They're not actually messaging each other anything yet because all you've done is just set up the messaging protocol. So you basically, you know, set up your phone line, but nobody's saying anything yet, which is probably like the worst metaphor ever. Now that we, ha now that everything's like satellites as opposed to, you know, tin cans on a string, but the metaphor works better if you're thinking tin cans on a string. So now let's initialize pacemaker, right? Because this is the one that does the, the heavy lifting. So let's initialize pacemaker, and your initialization is going to be a lot easier than your when you like actually configure it later, and we'll talk about that too. It's much more simple to initialize pacemaker than it was to initialize Corosync in the pacemaker service file you just put the name and the version no really it's that simple so here is etsy corosync service d dot service dot d pacemaker it says service name pacemaker version one that's it then you can start pacemaker start pacemaker and again verify with crm status so what does that look like well that looks like here here's your stack open ais so that's the stack it's using is corosync Here's your partition with quorum, and I'll talk more about what quorum is later. A version, there's two nodes configured, so there's two expected votes, which deals, that's a quorum thing, and zero resources configured. So zero resources means the agent, right? So that's the part that Bracona wrote, the resource agent. Um, and online, you've got host, host one and host two. And that can be whatever the host name, you know, whatever shows up in you name dash a kind of thing. You're now verifying that pacemaker works and it's talking to things. You haven't actually set Pacemaker up to talk to MySQL yet, right? That's the important part, right? So, but you know now that Pacemaker's working and it's using Corosync. So what do you need in your MySQL configuration? Probably you have all this already, but you need to configure it for replication and all of your masters and slaves need to because you might end up promoting a slave to be a master. So they need a server ID, right, that's different. They need the binary log turned on you need to be logging slave updates because if you change if you promote a slave to a master it's going to be need to logging everything not just what comes on its thing um, what you want to make sure of and this is where it gets different is you do not want to start mysql automatically on server restart why because pacemaker is what will control what starts and stops mysql so for auto failover you should have a replication user that doesn't just have replication client and replication slave but it should also have process, reload, and super because it's going to be changing stuff around. So it needs these permissions to be able to see what's going on, where is it in the, um, you know, in the master status, how, how far ahead is it, things like that. So at this point, MySQL should be running and you're all configured. So if you already have all this stuff configured, you may, like probably most of us would just need to make the replication user give it extra stuff. That's it. Um, other than that, we're pretty much probably all set with the environments we already have. So you have three of the four tools up now. You got MySQL, which you probably had up before. You have Corosync and Pacemaker. Now the, the remaining one is the MySQL agent for Pacemaker. And this is where a lot of the complexity comes in. So it's code on Percona GitHub. You download it from there. You've probably already downloaded it by now. Um, there's no GitHub releases, which means you can't just download a package. But it is in resource agents 3.9.3 or higher. 
So there, there is a package called Pacemaker Resource Agents. That I've, I don't know if it comes with Pacemaker, or if it's installed usually, or if you have to go get it yourself. But if you're, you've got version 3.9.3 or higher, the MySQL agent is already in there. So now imagine you have master, master, each with a slave. And you want both slaves to still be working even if one of the masters goes down. That's something where you would run, be running. That's a little more complex where, yeah, all that replication is going, but now if this master dies, you still want both slaves to still be talking to an active master. And the agent is where you have the failover rules and all that stuff. Yep, yep. So, yeah, so you have, you have the agent. You get it however you get it, either from resource agents or you get it from, you know, wget off of GitHub or check out the GitHub repository. If you're doing the checkout or the wget, you want to install it to a different directory than the resource agents. Otherwise, the next time you upgrade Pacemaker, it will blow away the agent. Now, that probably doesn't matter because the next time you upgrade it, you'll probably get the version 3.9 or 3 or higher, but just be careful. So you want to tell Pacemaker to use the agent, um, and you have to set a primitive. Now, this is where things get long and complicated and boring. Again, it's not hard. It's just tedious. So you have to, you have to say where the MySQL configuration file is. Not a problem. You have to tell it where the MySQL daemon binary is. You have to give it the MySQL process ID. You have to give it the socket. You have to give it the replication and test user authentication information. So we talked about making a replication user. You can also make a test user. And what the test user will do is it has to read from a test table. And you can set that as a rule for making something a read slave. So something is a, is a viable read slave if you could read from this test table. And that is a lot better as an idea than saying ping MySQL if it's up, right? If there's a MySQL process, well, then it's fine for reads. Well, the MySQL process can be up, and you know maybe EnoDB is corrupt and you can't do anything. So that's a good way to put um, a rule there. So that's, that's why they say have a test user. Um, the test user needs select on a test table. And there is more. Um, you can use CRM configure edit to load the primitive that you make. So here's an example of a primitive. Primitive P MySQL, so this is kind of your set is P MySQL, um, OCF Bracona MySQL, so that's your configuration file, param so here are now params. Your configuration file is etsy.my.cnf. The process ID is in varlib mysql, mysql.d.pid. There's your socket, there's your replication user, there's your replication password. Now this example comes straight from the um, Percona replication manager one. So that's not a password I made up. Um, max slave lag is 60. Oh, well what's max slave lag? That's what it means to be out of date. So if max slave lag is you say it's 60, then once you hit 60 seconds of slave lag, it's going to do something and say, that's not a good slave. Don't use that slave. Now go use something else. So that's, that's kind of cool. Now, one of the problems is, is if you have all of your machines are the same kind of hardware, you don't often run into a situation where one machine is lagging and, and everything else is fine. Usually it's everything is lagging. But, you know, it, it certainly is good to be notified and, and know when something is, is, uh, is starting to get out of date. And then if you want to know what you do with an out-of-date slave, that is uh, evict outdated slaves. So by default, evict outdated slaves is false. But if it's set to true, then when you get that far behind in replication lag, stop the slave. And the idea is, I think the, th I think the theory is that you stop the slave because you want to let whatever else is happening on the save finish. So that's evict outdated slave, and it defaults to false. There's your MySQL daemon binary. Um, here's your test user authentication information. Now, so this is interesting. This is where you start to talk about the role of master and how frequently you're going to monitor that role. And OCF check level is there's different levels of checking. So the interesting thing about this is that you actually have to have different monitoring intervals for the master and slave because pacemaker doesn't actually say okay let me check everybody who says they're a, they're a master and everyone who says they're a slave they actually go by the monitor, the monitor intervals so if you make them the same it's only going to check the master not the slaves because it's already checked the monitor interval of five seconds it's i don't know i you're shaking your head and i am too because i'm like i don't i don't know why they did that um but the intervals define the roles not the role name it's dumb, but that's the limitations you have to work with. There is also a start interval and a stop interval with a timeout. And what those are are um, you want to make sure that if you're starting or stopping MySQL, that if it doesn't start after, say, 60 seconds, which is what's configured here, then it will abort. 
right? Or if it doesn't stop MySQL after 60 seconds, then it will abort. Um, so you want to make sure that things like your buff number of uh, buffer pool, dirty pages, and all that kind of stuff, you can shut down cleanly within whatever the limit you've set is. Can you can you encrypt the password so it's not in clear text? Um, I don't think so, but this is basically kind of your configuration file for it. So you can change the permissions, things like that, of the files. But that's a good question. I don't know how Pacemaker stores it underlying, you know, if it's, a, if it's plain text or if it's encrypted at all. So Pacemaker MS, which is master slave, so to start the resources called pmysql, you would actually do this long kind of command in itself. So you say ms, ms underscore mysql, that's just the label for it, because again, you might have several ones. pmysql, which is, you define that over here, this primitive pmysql. Meta master max is one, master node max is one. Clone max equals two, clone node max is one, notify is true. Now the clone max is, is probably the most important one here. So this is basically saying you're only going to have the maximum number of masters you're going to have is one. You only have one master at a time, and there's only and by the way, there's only one node that's a master anyway. So if you had you might have two masters, but only one of them is a node. So master max would be two if you had two nodes that could be the master. Master node max would be one. Clone max here is two because you have two slaves, and but clone node max is one. And I have some descriptions here. Globally unique is false. Target role is master. Is managed is true. Yep, I knew I had some. There we go. Clone max is two. The clone max is the number of nodes. So currently you have two read slaves. Notify is true always has to be there. Um, and when you add a node, you would increase clone max. So if you had a third slave, you would then increase clone max to three. And notify equals true must be set. Um, set up virtual IPs for failover. So the test user is used with rules. For example, to be a reader, you have to read from a test table. Use CRM configure edit to add virtual IPs. And what this does is it gives roles using a virtual IP. So if you, I think I have an example here, yeah. If your write VIP is, vir, VIP is a virtual IP, by the way. So if your write VIP is 172.30.222.100, that's different from the IP address that's configured on your server itself. You're now adding another one on there. So this is how you do it. You do primitive writer uh, VIP OCF heartbeat IP address too. So this is your second IP address that your heartbeat is putting on it. And I don't know why this is heartbeat and not Corosync. This is, again, the example I get from there. Params, the, this is the IP. Um, the NIC is ETH1 or whatever the NIC is gonna be. Monitoring interval again. And again, it has to be different. So what if you have your read VIPs of 101 and 102? It's very similar, your reader VIP, you give it a name, reader VIP1. Um, again, OCF heartbeat, and a second IP address. Here's your param I, uh, IP, your, your params are IP and NIC, and the op monitor interval. And then if you have a second one, because you have two machines that you want to be slaves, you do that. Now what, what's gonna happen is, if one of these slaves isn't good, it's gonna take the, via, the virtual IP off of it. And now that, that's kind of like taking it out of the loop, out of the load balancer, if you will. Um, so now you have a MySQL cluster managed with Percona Replication Manager. So you've got Corosync, you've got Pacemaker, and you've got a good agent to use with Pacemaker, right? And then the fourth tool is MySQL itself. You can verify all this with CRM configure show, and this is what it looks like. It's going to be long. Node host one, host one, great. The attributes are P MySQL, MySQL master IP. So this is the IP of the server itself, 193. Node host 2 happens to be IP address ending in 212. Primitive pMySQL, OCF Percona MySQL. So this is using the resource agent, the Percona resource agent for MySQL. And then you have this big long, here's the, the parameters that we just we showed there, right? Etsy, my Etsy, and F, here's the PID, socket, replication information, tested user information, max slave lag, evict outdated servers, and the MySQL daemon. Then you have the op monitor interval is five seconds, your master. This is just verifying if you want to say, oh, did it really get in there? Did, do I have to reload it or anything? And this is what you can see. So again, these are all the, um, all the stuff we just were putting in there. Start interval, stop interval. Um, then you also see the, the VIPs because you've added this at this point. So again, this is very similar to what we were just talking about. So here's your reader VIPs are 101 and 102. Your writer VIP is 100. Then you'll also see 
right? Because now again, this is the master slave stuff. So there's a lot of information this CRM configure shows showing, showing everything you just configured. Matter master max, master node max, clone max, all this stuff, um, location, here's the rule. And again, the rule for the reader vips one and reader vip two. So you could actually have two different sets of vips. You could actually have something that's like an admin thing. And maybe you only need to read, read from this table for the admin, but you have to read from that table for the, for the readers. Co-location writer vip on master. So this is talking about where the writer is. It's on the, ma the MySQL master. Order MS, MySQL promote before vip. So you promote the writer vip first. If you have a bunch of writers and a bunch of reads, you're going to want to promote one of the writers first. And you can change those rules. The property is the cluster information-based bootstrap options that you don't really change. There's a version. Uh, what's the infrastructure? It's open AIS. Expected quorum votes is two. Uh, no quorum policy is nor. Stone if enable is false. And I'll talk about that in the last refresh. <coughs> and the property ID is MySQL application. And I think that's it. This is where it is in the slave status. So am I missing something? Correct. So virtual IP is just a different IP address on the same physical wire. But it doesn't go to the machine. It doesn't say this machine is good. It says this virtual IP is good. And then it tests the machine, and if the machine is good, Pacemaker puts that virtual IP on the machine. Okay. So it's not like a load balancer where you'd have one read of virtual IP going to 10 different slaves. You would have 10 different virtual IPs going to 10 different slaves, okay. um, which kind of makes it annoying and a little fiddly, but... That's, that's, how, that's how it decides to do it. So if you really wanted to see if everything was working, that's kind of a crazy way to monitor it. You would never do CRM configure show to monitor it, to see is it up and running. Um, you would do it to say, what's the configuration? Show me everything in the configuration. You know, just like you might grep the my.cnf file for a certain configuration. The way you monitor it is using CRM status or CRM mon. And they basically, they both show the same information, but CRM mon works like top where you get a screen and it refreshes every second. So this is what uh, CRM status will show. When it was last updated, when the last change was, the stack, so again, CoroSync, OpenAIS, current cluster information, you have host of one partition with quorum, the version, two nodes are configured, two expected votes in the quorum, and there are five resources configured, right? So now you have the agents on each machine and you have the agents and the virtual IP, the three virtual IPs plus the two agents. So online, you've got host one and host two are online. So this is your simple two node cluster. All that just to get a simple two node cluster. It's a master slave set. The masters are host one, the slaves are host two. And you've got a reader VIP, reader VIP one and reader VIP two. So this is actually, even though it says the slave is host two, you might say, well, but it's reading from master one and master, it's reading from host one and host two. Host one isn't a slave of itself. So when you think master and slave, it's not reads and writes. Reads and writes are controlled by the virtual IPs. Master and slave means this is the main one and this is the pool of things that I might promote from. And you have a writer rip is also on host one. So what if you want to do some maintenance? You can do CRM node standby in the host name. So CRM node standby host O2. And that would put that in standby node mode and it's not using anything. So you don't have to like shut down MySQL in order to take it out of the load balancer or something like that. Right? I say take it out of the load balancer because that's kind of the uh, analogy. But to take it out, you don't have to take off the virtual IP or anything like that. If you, do, if you put it in standby mode, you can do that. And if you want to take it out, you say CRM node online. So that's how you can take something out to do some maintenance. Now, if you're using Percona Replication Manager with only two hosts like we're using, so it has this thing called quorum. When one host behaves badly, what it does is it takes a quorum of all the other hosts to say, what do you think we should do about this? If there's only two hosts, there's no such thing as a quorum because there's only one machine to get, like one machine dies, so there's only one machine left. So there's no way to do a majority of, what do you think, what do you think? It doesn't know. So what happens is it'll ignore it. And if one machine goes down, the other machine won't pick up the slack, which is usually not what you want. Now granted, if you want this kind of high availability, you probably have more than two machines in your cluster. But if you don't, then you want to make sure that you add the no quorum policy ignore, which I think you saw in the previous um, examples there, where it was saying quorum ignore, and what that means is forget about quorum. 
let it pick up the slack if this one machine dies. That would uh, be true for every even number of nodes? It would, no. It's not true for every even number of nodes because when you have, let's say you have four nodes, one goes down, you have three machines with which to figure out. But if you have a separation in the network for some reason, and now you have two nodes by themselves, which one will take is like the half brain? Yeah, if you have a split brain situation, that's that's difficult. And that, that may actually be getting into this next thing, which is the stoneth, the shoot the other node in the head, which is if you're not using stoneth, right? So if there's a split brain situation and you're not doing anything to shoot the other node in the head, which is kind of the situation, like what do you do? You have to tell Pacemaker so that stoneth is not enabled. Pacemaker is going to assume that any machine that's up is good. So they're going to assume that you've shot the other node in the head if you don't want it there. So yeah, that is a, that is a difficult situation and you can, you're going to have to configure some kind of shoot the other node in the head or figure it out. So yeah, that's, that's a little difficult, but again, there's only so much Pacemaker can do and how is it going to decide if there's a network blip or there's actually a separation? So that's all I really have. There's more that it can do. You can promote a master. Like I said in the beginning, the, the script does promoting masters. Um, there's a bunch of other things that you can do with it. There's a really great, uh, this Percona page has a lot of different things. First of all, they have a lot of tests. So here, create a database, um, insert into write load, um, here's how you do manual fa failover. Here's how you can test slave lagging. Um, here's how you can break, you know, here's what happens if you, they, they're giving you all these tests to do to say, run this on your machine, see what happens on your cluster. So that does the failover and takes care of, like, a master goes down, the load of slave, slave goes down, it gets evicted, you know, whatever. Uh, but, so I have an application pointing to the IP address connecting to the master. Uh huh. Is there, does this tie into anything that would actually give me the new IP address of the slave to fall over? That's the beauty of it. There's no new IP address because the IP addresses are the, are the VIPs, the, the virtual IPs that you give it. So once you give the master the virtual IP, that's the IP you use. Oh, so you awesome. configure it in your application to use that master virtual IP, yeah. and then whichever one is the master will have that IP. Oh. Yeah. So if a machine goes down, something else that comes out of a master will take on that. Right. Or you can do it manually by promoting it. So yeah, they give you a bunch of different ways to do tests. You reboot one new, they, they also have a lot of how-tos, how to add a new node. So remember I said you had to change clone max equal to three. Um, so you, again, if you're adding a new node, you still have to have MySQL on it. You have to configure core sync like you did before. You have to initialize pacemaker and give it all that information. But then all the other pacemakers have to be told, hey, now there's three nodes, not two. So that's where the clone max comes into play and how to repair a replication, how to exclude a node for this. So this is, this is interesting. You were talking about how, like setting weights on or order of which machines could go and be promoted. So you can actually give it a priority that says, there's two different ways that you can do something. You can say a priority saying, like order it in a certain order. Like maybe you have two really fast machines and two slow machines. And so if one of the fast machines is a master and it breaks, you want it to go to the second fast machine first. So you can give it a higher priority or you can give things a lower priority. So you see this negative 1,000 is actually saying the location of void being the master. Give it a negative 1,000, meaning it's going to it's going to be like, you could use me if you really want to, but I'm not your first choice. You can also say never be the master by giving it negative infinity. So you can actually have something like an administrative node that's up and in the cluster, but will never, you know, guaranteed never to become the master. Or you can have something like, well, as a last resort, you can make me the master. So yeah, this, the, the documentation is pretty good once you get your head wrapped around all the parts. And this is all on the GitHub page, so I don't know if you can see that I highlighted up there, but that's github.com slash Percona slash Percona Pacemaker Agents. So this is basically the readme that comes with it. So the documentation is actually pretty good. Um, it shows you how to do backups, um, telling the reader VIP to avoid the writers, meaning that no reader should ever be promoted to the master, you should only promote from the master pool, things like that. So it's very good. It seems like mostly config files are fairly puppet friendly. That's yes, so the question is, are most of the config files puppet and chef and you know, kind of configuration management friendly? Yes, there's a lot of it, and that's especially with IPv4, if you're on the same subnet, 
you don't even need to change most of them, um, which is kind of cool. But yeah, they're they're pretty puppet friendly, um, and that that's also cool because what you can do is you can set a flag, right, to say okay, these are you know this is now a writer in this ring, and this is a reader in this ring, and then you can just change machines around um, using puppet or chef. Has anybody actually ever used IPv6 for? Yeah, we're starting to. We have we have a bunch of websites. Mozilla has a bunch of websites that are using IPv6. So that's all we have for this meeting.